Okay, so this lecture we're going to look at uh, practical engine cycles um, and focus uh, specifically on internal combustion engines. So there are two common cycles, uh, the Otto and the diesel cycle. Um, and uh, what we're going to try and do is explain why uh, they differ from the Carnot cycle, which is what we covered in the previous lecture. So the key thing about a Carnot cycle is it's the most efficient engine that you can theoretically build uh, and the key thing is because of the way in which heat is transferred to the engine and the way it is rejected in the sense that it doesn't produce any net change uh, in the entropy of the environment and this is very different to a practical engine cycle because the heat transfer um, assumptions are practical um, and they always generate um, some net entropy uh, for the environment. So what do we mean by uh, a practical engine? Um, so in the Carnot cycle, we use an isothermal heat transfer process, which is almost a, the very definition of an impractical heat transfer process. It needs to happen very slowly, and you need to have a very good uh, heat transfer surface. Um, so in the real world, we want to run our engines at a certain number of uh, revolutions per minute. Um, and so we need our heat transfer processes to be relatively quick. Uh, so that obviously means we have to transfer over a temperature difference. And other sort of aspects to what limits the efficiency of our engine is to, to do with uh, first the hot reservoir temperature. So this is really um, comes down to what, what uh, the engine can withstand in terms of the combustion temperature. So this is not too much of a problem for um, uh, Otto cycles and diesel cycles, but it's very much an issue uh, for gas turbines, which we cover in the next lecture. And obviously we're limited in terms of the, um, the, the cold temperature limit, uh, because this is the temperature, this is the ambient temperature in which the, uh, the engine is operating, and this is the, the temperature that in which we pull, pull fluid in um, to uh, um, start the cycle again. And the main reason why our thermal efficiency in a practical engine is less than, a, than it is um, in a real engine is the fact that um, we have heat transfer inefficiencies. And then on top of that, we have some real life uh, losses due to things like um, friction, um, crevice flows, so we get a little bit of gas that goes around the cylinder, um, and uh, mechanical losses, combustion losses, uh, and so on and so on. Okay, so typically um, we're, we're, we're struggling to get heat converted into work with these heat engines. So um, we've covered this in the previous lecture, and since this is a video of the lecture, I'm just going to refer you back to the, to the previous lecture. Um, and in terms of uh, what we've got for an Otto cycle, um, so we assume that uh, the combustion process in an Otto cycle is very fast, and this really reflects um, the premix nature of the combustion. Um, and, and so we get a very large change in pressure for a very small change in volume um, and we model um, the combustion as a constant volume heat transfer and generic uh, assumption for the getting rid of the exhaust gases and pulling in a fresh gas um, in the intake stroke we model that as a constant volume uh, heat transfer heat rejection so we can work out how much energy comes into our engine and how much is rejected simply by our um, the, the analysis of our systems that we that we've done in, in previous lectures. Um, so we can work these two things out, and we can define the thermal efficiency of an Otto cycle. This is uh, the network. So this is what we want. Um, what do we pay for? We pay for it in terms of the energy that we put into our engine. So this is the fuel from our combustion um, and then we can use the first law for a cycle to convert this equation to 1 minus q out over q in 
and we can put these terms in and we end up with uh, an equation that looks like this. So this is our um, thermal efficiency for our Otto cycle. Um, now from a practical point of view, uh, this is not really very much use for us because if you're an engine designer, effectively you're going to design your engine and then you're going to characterize it. And really what you want to do is to characterize your efficiency in terms of a engine design parameter. And the classic engine design parameter um, for, for uh, internal combustion engines is the compression ratio. So this is, um, so this is defined R is V1 over V2. So if we look at V1 on the curve here, then um, uh, we can see this is the bottom dead center. So this is maximum volume from maximum volume of the cylinder. And V2 is the volume of the cylinder at um, top dead center. So this is the minimum clearance volume. So the compression ratio is really just the, the ratio of these two volumes. And um, how do we get from uh, our temperature-based thermal efficiency to a compression ratio-based thermal efficiency? We take our um, uh, adiabatic compression relationship. So this is PV to the gamma equals a constant or if you like p1 v1 to the gamma is equal to p2 <coughs> v2 to the gamma and we take the gas law <coughs> excuse me which is p1 v1 over t1 would be equal to p2 v2 divided by t2 uh, we put those two things together and we can write temperature ratios uh, in terms of the volume ratios um, adding a, a, uh, a factor for gamma. So if you remember, gamma is Cp divided by Cv. And we can take these temperature ratios and we can put that into this equation here and do a little bit of uh, mathematical playing around. And we end up with the thermal efficiency of an auto cycle. Okay. So what does a auto cycle efficiency look like? Well, it looks a little bit like this. So I want you to just concentrate on this RC equals one curve. And we'll come on to why that is uh, in a minute. Um, so the general characteristic is that um, at small compression ratios, um, the thermal efficiency of a Otto cycle is terrible. And it increases with um, compression ratio, um, but the rate of increase sort of falls off as, as you get to very large um, values. So obviously, from the point of view of how would you like to run an auto cycle, the, the, the correct answer is as well uh, as high a possible compression ratio as I can, if you please, sir. And the problem with an auto cycle is we get this problem called knocking. So this, is, this happens because um, we're injecting fuel into uh, the intake stroke and our fuel evaporates, creates a uh, petrol vapor. It's very well mixed with oxygen. And during the intake stroke, the piston is coming down to the bottom dead center. And then the intake valve shuts. And then the engine does its compression uh, stroke. And it compresses this fuel air mixture um, up to the top dead center. And while it's doing that, it's pressurizing the fuel. And it's heating it up because it's compressing the fuel um, adiabatically. And if you're not careful, or if you over compress it, um, your, your, your pre-mixed fuel vapor oxygen mixture will go bang before um, the piston reaches top dead center and the spark plug goes off. So this is called knocking, um, very bad for the engine, um, does nothing for the efficiency. Um, so, and Practically, what it means is there's a, there's a fundamental compression limit, compression ratio limit on what an auto cycle can sustain. And it's roughly about 10. Okay, so with a, with a compression ratio of about 10, we've got a, a theoretical engine efficiency of about 60%. Now, this is, this is the theoretical efficiency. Um, and then we have to add on all of our practical inefficiencies like viscous losses and turbulence losses and um, combustion inefficiencies and, and various things like that. So your typical engine efficiency for a, your standard petrol car 
might be 45, 55% efficient. So effectively, all of the heat that we are adding to our engine, um, we're only getting 50% of that out as, as useful work. So back in the sort of 60s, um, people were aware of this and they tried to uh, come up with ways to mitigate this. Um, and at the time, they thought it was a, a great idea to add uh, tetraethyl ethyl lead um, into the petrol because this um, stabilized uh, the, the fuel vapor and prevented knocking. Um, it had the unfortunate effect that it um, didn't do the brain development of small children very good in cities. Um, so in the 70s, uh, they phased it out um, and uh, it was a bit of a problem. These days, uh, now because um, uh, petrol engines um, can be very tightly controlled, um, they're ele electronically controlled, so you've got electronically controlled fuel injection systems, you've got very complex um, valve timing systems, you can have multi um, multi injection uh, fuel injection strategies and so on. And because of these advances, um, modern mod modern engines are, are much better than the old um, engines from the sort of late 60s, early 70s, um, even though we don't have to add any nasty chemicals to prevent, prevent um, knock. So when we start looking at uh, diesel engines, they're pretty much the same uh, as a petrol engine uh, with a key difference in the way that the fuel is injected. And this has a significant effect on the efficiency of an engine. Um, so with a, with a diesel engine, you don't inject the fuel during the intake stroke. All you're doing is just injecting uh, cold air. Um, and so during the intake stroke, you're pulling in fresh charge of air the, the, the piston gets to the bottom of the cylinder, bottom dead center, intake valve shuts, uh, the engine does its work, its compression stroke, and the key thing is that the, the engine, it, it, all it's doing is just compressing air. So there's no fuel vapor in there at all. So that means that this, this knock effect that you have in auto cycles is completely impossible. So that means with a, with a diesel engine, effectively, you, you can, you can um, have much larger compression ratios. So um, the, w the way a diesel engine works is, is you, you have a much larger compression ratio so the fuel is compressed to a much um, uh, larger extent so it's higher pressure and crucially uh, it's much higher temperature as well and when you inject the f so you inject uh, the, f the diesel fuel directly into uh, the engine cylinder pretty much at top dead center and your 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 fuel injection system for a diesel engine it, it, it runs at very very high pressure so it might be a thousand fifteen hundred bar um, and and you're generating very very small drops and so the, the liquid jet has to atomize uh, it forms a, a plume um, the drops have to spread out um, they have to evaporate and once you get a sufficient amount of um, fuel vapor um, at, a, at, the, at a combustible um, uh, mixture, the, the, the fuel auto ignites. It just goes bang all on its own. Um, and then as, as, the, as, the, as the area around the fuel jet heats up, the, the combustion sort of erodes into the rest of the fuel spray, spray and, and burns a lot of the, a lot of of the fuel okay um, so that means the combustion process uh, it, it takes a lot longer than it does in an auto cycle and we assume that the heat addition in our model diesel engine is a constant pressure process so the idea is that while the compression while the combustion process is going on uh, the, the piston is moving away from top dead center and roughly um, the, the the heat addition is sort of done at roughly constant pressure. Okay, so <clears throat> the other advantage about using a diesel engine is that um, it's a it's a more simple engine. I mean, it's bigger. You need a lot more metal because you're you're 
you're compressing the fuel a lot, a lot. Uh, sorry, you're compressing the air uh, a lot more. Um, but it's much simpler in the sense that you don't need a spark plug. You don't need to play around with the spark plug timing. Um, and also the, the engine is much less uh, sensitive to the type of fuel that you can use. So pretty much anything that burns, more or less, um, that self-lubricates can be used in a diesel engine. So biodiesels, diesels, mineral oils, straight vegetable oils, um, mixtures, they're all pretty good in terms of um, running a diesel engine. And the same cannot be said for an auto cycle. You have to be very specific about um, the combustion characteristics of petrol for them to be able to work. So what does a, a diesel cycle look like? Um, so it's more or less the same as an auto cycle. The only difference is the heat transfer process. So this is now a constant pressure heat addition. And um, when we work out uh, the heat addition, we use the enthalpy change. So there's a CP here. And the heat rejection is the same as an auto cycle. So if we want to work out the thermal efficiency, we work out uh, this thing here. So we take these two things and put them into our equation. And you'll notice that we end up with a gamma on the bottom of this uh, equation, which is different to the auto cycle. So the auto cycle was just two temperature ratios. And if you remember, this is the ratio of the specific heats. And if you remember, the ratio of the specific heats, CP divided by CV, always bigger than one. So by definition, the, the thermodynamic efficiency of a diesel cycle for the same temperature um, um, range um, is always going to be less efficient than um, an auto cycle. And um, in terms of how we characterize uh, a diesel engine, we do it in the same way. So we still use the compression ratio, which is the same thing that we use in an auto cycle. And we need to um, come up with a correction uh, to, the, to the, the efficiency term. And it's called this RC. So this is um, the cutoff ratio. So in effect, this is the this is the ratio between the volume of the cylinder when it starts burning, so that's uh, V2, uh, and when the combustion finishes, which is V3. So if you've got a really slow old diesel engine with a very low injection pressure, this, this um, RC um, con um, ratio is going to be quite big, so the combustion will take quite a long time. If, on the other hand, you've got quite a modern um, high-speed diesel that you find in um, today's um, cars, the, the, the RC value um, is quite small um, because the combustion relatively happens quite quickly. Okay, so you have to do a little bit more um, algebraic ma manipulation to go from uh, the temperature based thermal efficiency to, to this equation uh, here. So I'm not going to expect you to derive this. I just want you to accept that this is the thermal efficiency for a diesel engine. And you'll notice that there's a bit here. So this bit 1 minus r gamma to the minus 1. This is your, this is your auto cycle efficiency. And then we've got this correction term um, on in the, in the square brackets. And this term is a function of RC. So this is this is always um, uh, this is our diesel engine corrector. And you can, if you think about this, um, RC is always going to be bigger than one. So this term is always um, going to be a bit bigger than one. So this negative term is always going to be a bit bigger than the Otto cycle. And so therefore, it's another way of saying that your diesel engine thermal efficiency is going to be less than the Otto cycle. Uh, thermal efficiency. So what does the um, diesel cycle uh, thermal efficiency look like? Um, so we've got this figure again and we now understand what this um, RC uh, parameter is. So for an auto cycle um, it's identically one um, and as you get slower speed diesels um, your thermal efficiency degrades as the RC value increases. But <coughs> the clever bit is that uh, we're not limited by the compression ratio. 
So your typical diesel engine uh, in, a, in a car um, might have compression ratio of 20, 22, uh, as opposed to the uh, limited compression ratio of an Otto cycle, which is around about 10. So with my Otto cycle um, uh, thermal efficiency, I might have uh, thermal efficiency of 60% perhaps. Um, but when I start looking at my um, compression ratio for a diesel engine, and let's say it's quite a fast one, so I'm not far off um, RC, at least just a bit bigger than one, I can get a much, well, I wouldn't say much bigger, but I can get a, a, um, a higher thermal efficiency than I can um, with uh, an Otto cycle. And it's for this reason that um, um, large steady power outputs, so trucks and ships, um, traditionally will use diesel because it's fundamentally more efficient. Okay, so um, we've introduced auto and diesel cycles. Um, we know that an auto cycle is theoretically more efficient, um, but in practice, um, we can design out this um, theoretical inefficiency of the diesel cycle because we can uh, use a, a higher compression ratio and this gives it a better practical uh, thermal efficiency and this is why trucks use diesel uh, rather than petrol. Okay, uh, thank you very much.